It's time for The Drive on TSN 1200, sending you home with everything you need to know about sports. Now with A.J. Jakubek, here's Lee Versage. Good afternoon. Welcome to The Drive here on TSN 1200. Lee Versage, A.J. Jakubek, Matt Conesvita. The day after Labor Day when everything starts and everything changes. Lots to talk about, as always, between the world of hockey and football. A lot of fantasy drafts going on with the Canadian Football League is going through. Got some soccer to talk about. Like I said, AJ, everything is happening. How was your long weekend? How are you? Doing well, thanks. Good to be with you guys, as always. Good long weekend. And, uh, yeah, lots to talk about for sure. But uh, I think we... Mm-hmm. We're all kind of on a bit of a somber note as well here. Today. Reeling a little bit. We yeah. are. And, and hi, Matt Consvita. Hello. Look forward to, you know, the weekend sports and really the month of sports of September. It just feels different. There's so much going on. But as you said, uh, AJ, um, it not an easy day around here at TSN 1200. A long time colleague of ours. James Absent, who uh, left a couple of years ago, uh, unfortunately passed away. And um, we are in a little bit of shock and certainly a lot of sadness when it comes to uh, all the, the memories that we have with James, who was a huge, huge part of our team here. When I first came to... Team 1200, TSN 1200, James Abson was already here and already behind the scenes learning how the business goes. And technically, I learned a lot as a producer and somebody who wanted to get into the business. James had a firm control of what was going on behind the scenes immediately. And uh, that is some of what I, what I learned from. And AJ, as we've gone through the years, uh, he's been a huge part of the drive, a huge part of Senators and Red Blacks and everything else. And it was a, just a real tough blow to be able to hear that news uh, over the weekend. Yeah, someone that we all worked with, you know, on a, on a regular basis here who was a part of, you know, so many different shows here and, and a part of Sens hockey and, and a, a part of, you know, Red Blacks football. And, you know, I, I mentioned this today on Twitter that, you know, when you think of the most iconic moments sports-wise in, in, in the history of the city and certainly within the last two decades, you know, James Abson was producing here at T, TSN 1200 for almost all of those big moments from, you know, I, I think back to 2007 when I was in the studio back then, Steve Lloyd was typically hosting pre and intermissions, but for the first three rounds of the playoffs, that was my role with Scott MacArthur handling post game duties and Mike Eastwood working with both of us. And when Daniel Alfredson scored the goal to send the Ottawa senators to the Stanley Cup final, I was in the studio with Mike Eastwood, Scott MacArthur, and James Abson. And, you know, when, when second and 25 happened and Henry Burris hit Greg Ellingson, you know, it was James Abson who was back in the studio. It was James who was the one, hey, can you get that clip out there? I think it might go a little bit viral. And he's the one that made sure it got out there, right? And he, he's... He's the one responsible for so many different things behind the scenes that often don't get recognized, but certainly was always recognized by us that, that knew him. And, you know, I think, a you know, 37 minute scoreboard beds on, uh, on, on the Sens post game show, working with Sean Donovan and he's, you know, firing up the, the same music bed six or seven times over and wow. kind of rolling his eyes and rap. smiling at me. Rap, AJ, no, rap. No, it's break. 
Break. Break. Late. Break. Late. Late. <laughs> and then, and then, you know, basically, he knew. You know, he liked to have the odd smoke. He he, he knew when I was when I was about to do the scoreboard. He always gave me a big smile. Well, you, you had time for two. You, yeah. You're you're gonna go a little bit long here, right? And, and then so he'd go for a smoke, come back, and 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 then he'd roll his eyes and smile because you know we went way longer like than game three or something than than even suspected. So, but just always so humble, so kind, just a just a kind, gentle soul that. Uh, you couldn't help but like, and, uh, you know, we, we, we know his family quite well as well, especially his mom, uh, Jan, who, you know, has worked security at, uh, 67s and, and Red Blacks games and just all events at TD Place for a long, long time. And, you know, kept in touch with James, you know, the last couple of years here. And yeah, it's a, it's, it's, uh, it's a tough blow. It's, it hurts. It hurts, uh. For everyone that knows him, for everyone that, um, you know, even got to know him, you know, a handful of times, he was just a, a, a really nice, kind, gentle soul. And, uh, this is a tough one here for, for all of us today. And Maddie, I know he influenced you a little bit. He influenced all of us here because. Well, starting said- out as a producer here, mm-hmm. uh, James was the guy who trained me. I remember sitting in 15 years ago, coming in on like a, a Tuesday night, and th- this was back before we were necessarily fully automated. I can't remember if we needed an overnight person. Uh, I don't think so, but I remember sitting in with James, and he would be producing, like operating Fox Sports Radio, and he would do local updates and give you the, how are you? I'm James Absin. And I, I remember sitting in and-, and training with him on just running Fox Sports Radio and jumping out to play commercials and uh, like him teaching me I'd have to record the update because I couldn't do the update myself. And, you know, learning the old board that we had, we have a new board now, but learning everything about that board from James and all sorts of different programming stuff and and that's how it started. But uh, just, you know, going on to work alongside him in so many things in, in... you know, a new programming system. James and I were the ones who would program all the, all the shows in, in the new automation system. And I mean, working on the drive with him. And I know we're going to have Ian Mendez on earlier or uh, later on in the show. But uh, it was, you know, when when that drive show launched with Ian, I think you were doing some updates at the very beginning, Lee, mm-hmm. if memory serves. But it wasn't long till I was on the update desk. Ian and Simmer were in studio, and James, James Absin was on this side of the glass, and it was the four of us doing the show Monday to Friday every every week, and you know working filling in for Hammer, be it at Red Blacks or or Sens games, working with James in that capacity, and you know starting out as someone who trained me, and you know becoming colleagues over the the years we had here, and and working together with him, just an absolute consummate pro. And so, so dedicated to the station. And if, if, if ever early on, especially in my career, if I had any hiccups, any issues, James was always there to take the phone call and walk you through it. And, uh, just did a lot as, as AJ said, a lot for the station that maybe you didn't realize you were hearing on a day-to-day basis, Mm -hmm. but a big, big part of the fabric here at uh, CFGO. One of my favorite memories of James was... The show that kind of got out of hand a little bit, in a good way, I guess. But it got out of Which hand. Which one? Yeah, most of them, Matt. But, uh, AJ, you can attest because we asked you to sing, and you <laughs> didn't. And then all of a sudden you stormed back in about an hour and a half later. Bud and, the Spud. And, and you sang. But James Abson came over to the other side of the glass, and he was rarely over here. Do you guys know if he was on the air doing traffic or weather or anything, he was sitting, Matt, where you're sitting right now. He would rarely come over on this side of the glass to be on the air. But he did that day. And he sang a song to his wife. And it was one of those moments that you just realized you'll, it'll never happen again. 
it was terrible and beautiful at the same time because it wasn't good. But uh, but he was singing to his wife, and that part was beyond anything I'd ever really seen out of James before because he rarely showed that side of him. He's a real, he a real technical, organized mind, right, and certain ways of doing things, and he wanted, you know, behind the glass things to be done a certain way. Majority of the time yelling at people like AJ and I to get out. But... Rarely did he show that side of his kind of personality or emotion on the air. And he did so that day. And I remember walking out going, that show might have got out of hand, but I've never heard James Absin like that. I've never heard a lot of us, but he was the guy that stuck out that day. Because of the way that he sang to his wife and it was just, like yeah. I said, terrible and beautiful all at the same time. A little earth, wind, and fire. Yeah. And I remember he got off time. They couldn't hear the backing track, mm-hmm. so it was a little askew at the beginning, but it, he he figured it out and uh, ended strong. And, yeah, I that brought a smile to my face when you brought that up because yeah. I'd forgotten that James sang. I always think of Henry Burris singing Jodeci. Mm-hmm. You... Being oh. a, not doing karaoke, but just singing along but, to but the track of yeah. Cult of Personality, Creature doing some Bon Jovi. But he came in here and sang Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yeah. And he did it to his... Anyway. It, yeah. it, Went out to Barb. I will always remember that just because he did not show that side of him very often, if at all, on the air. And he did that day. And when I was getting in trouble for the show going awry like that... Some of my point back to is like we saw sides of people today that and heard sides of people that we never seen before, and he's number one on that list. Um, yeah, and, and the vivid memories of him wanting to have the station run properly because, like I said, his mind was very organized, and if things were to be done a certain way, there was no going off of that path. I did, AJ, you did, I think other people did, and he didn't love it, but he always kind of put up with that in a, I'm not happy about it, but I'll do it way. And I always appreciated that from him because I knew what he was going through, but I also knew how I wanted to do it. And you got to kind of meet in the middle and some of the other times like, All those games, AJ, and I know you've done a lot of them. I've done a few of them too. The late games. Yeah. The games that went till post game went till two or three in the morning. Well, and and it always seemed like like the ones out west. Yep. Oh, this will be a short one tonight, James. (laughs) It's just me. Like those would be the ones where, okay, there'd there'd be no co host, right? We'd have a co host in the pregame show and then. We do the intermissions with Gord, you know, from Calgary or Vancouver or San Jose or wherever. Oh yeah, you know what, James? This is gonna be we're gonna be out of here in hour and fifteen, hour and a half tops. And next thing you know, I'm taking texts from you know, people that are working late shifts and people that are working, you know, that are out west, people that are in, you know, Taiwan and Japan and Australia and Next thing you know, we're at two hours and 15 minutes and he's rolling his eyes, smiling. Yeah. And I thought, I thought we were going to have a short one tonight. Well, you know me, James, <laughs> uh, doesn't really exist. And when, when I say short, you know, like you, you, you got to always take that with the, uh, with a large grain of salt. And, and he did. And he, then he smiled and laughed. I mean, I remember working game seven on the post game show after uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins defeated the Ottawa Senators and <laughs> I I was convinced that I was going right through until six o'clock and then we compromised I'm like James okay when when the calls stop coming that's when when we'll stop I'm not just going to keep you here all night and I think the calls stopped at about 4:15 uh on on that day and in, in the spring of 2017 and got off the air and 
you know, he, he always had a smile. He, he knew it was for the best of the station and, and he enjoyed it too. I mean, he, he enjoyed that part of it too, because like I said, he always had that shake of the head, the roll of the eyes, but the smile, that knowing smile that, okay, that, that, it's the way it is. I, I got stuck with AJ tonight, and we're going to be a little bit longer. Is why I appreciated it. He liked me more because of those stories, AJ. I think he liked everyone working more. with everybody else more <laughs> no, on the post. He did. Show. He was. He would walk in and go, "Oh man, AJ was here till three a.m. Please tell me you're not going to be here till three a.m. Yeah. Like, and he would walk in that way, and then, you know, a couple of the late nights, I would. I would drive him home and he would just be, you know, thanks. I really didn't want to walk home at, at 3 a.m. I'm like, of course. He's like, no, I, I really appreciate it because it's tough for me sometimes to, to do this late stuff. And I'm like, yep, I got it. I think we all got it. It's, you couldn't have said it better, AJ. Sometimes he was gruff, but... Never in a way that was uncaring about the station. He he cared a lot about this station. And sometimes it was deep down, but he would always do what's best for the station, even if he'd give you an eye roll or a, a gruff remark. I think other people would have done worse. <laughs> <laughs> for me, for you, and, and for... A lot of the people, the the people who work behind the scenes in all sorts of media, but especially in radio, they have to do so much that you never hear. And James was one of those guys. So I know uh, Ian, when he comes on today at his regular time at 420, Ian worked uh, with James. So I I think he'll have a, a couple of words as well at that time. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but we certainly are going to miss him. It's a tough day around here. There's no other way to put it. Um, we'll take a break and uh, we'll come back. There is a lot to get into in uh, the world of, of sports. I mean, tennis, what the Canadians are doing between Fernandez and OJ Aliasim, both on the court in the quarterfinals. Coming up, uh, lots of soccer talk, tons of football talk. We're only two days away from the NFL opener. Uh, James Duke Ellingson will join us just after 5 o'clock. He gets hijacked by the morning show starting next week. So this is our last week to talk to him. Uh, we'll we'll talk to him just after 5. Matt, that wasn't a shot. Don't worry. It's fine. It should have been. Hmm. They, they take Pooley. They take everyone. Now they take Duke. Now they take everyone. They're coming for Ian next. Oh, they already did that when you were on the morning show. Yeah, that's so. Um, <laughs> you were there. But that's that's true. <laughs> I was an accomplice, but I was... How long till Dave Smart goes? Sitting in the back seat. Smart but talk in the mornings. We are going to talk, uh, like I said, some football from NFL to CFL to hockey. Of course, the Drake Batherson signing on Friday with the... Montreal Canadiens didn't do on the weekend. There's just so much to get into in the world of sports. Uh, and we will do that after Matt Consfield looks at traffic and weather for the first time here on The Drive on TSN 1200. Let's get back to The Drive on the home of the Sens, TSN 1200. Welcome back to The Drive here on TSN 1200. Lieber Sage, AJ Jakubek, and uh, Matt Consfield. Ian Mendez at 420, senior writer from The Athletic, uh, James Duke Ellingson at the 505. Today, we'll lead us into the Red Black show tonight. And uh, a couple of special guests, AJ and Matt, uh, Micah Alway will join me. Very optimistic after what happened to the Red Blacks on the weekend, which if you heard his interview, you would have thought they won by 40. Uh, they didn't. So he will join me and uh, Jock Climey, former CFLer and, of course, on the TSN panel, uh, will come on uh, the passing of Bob Wettenhall. Uh, Jock will come on to talk about that former owner of the Montreal Alouettes and 
Um, I know Jock has some stories about Bob, so that will happen between uh, 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock. Tonight, I can tell you that Leila Fernandez is going to take on the number five seed, Alina Svitolina of the Ukraine. Coming up in about... Of Ukraine. Come on. Sure. Uh, well, no, sure. It's That's the country. It's Ukraine. It's not the Ukraine and I think Ukrainian Canadians. And it is, by the way, it's uh, Ukrainian Canadian Heritage Day. Mm-hmm. It's not the Ukraine. It's Ukraine. Okay. Anyways, five all mi- good. Mistake fi- is the mistake, but uh, I, I think we'd all appreciate if people don't throw the the in front of Ukraine. Okay, fair enough. Five minutes, that match will take place in the quarterfinals. And then tonight, 9 o'clock, it will be Felix Oje Aliasim and... Uh, he's got a pretty good draw tonight, going against the the Spaniard Alcaraz, who is seated much lower than Felix. So a chance to get to the semis, and the two Canadians today in quarterfinal action at the U.S. Open. Uh, there's a ton to get to, AJ, with hockey and CFL and NFL and tennis. What's on your mind here first? What do you want to get to? Yeah, soccer too, but uh, yep. we'll, we'll start. Uh, we'll start with CFL. I mean, I was at practice today, and Dominic Davis taking first team reps at quarterback. So I, I don't think anyone would be surprised after what we witnessed on the weekend. Uh, you know, fifty-one twenty-nine against Montreal, a game where you know the defense, after you know basically bending but not breaking for three games, well, they broke. They weren't very good. So that's problematic because if this team is going to win games down the stretch and there's still 10 games left, I'm not going to come here and, you know, I I think it would be easy for anyone to come here and say this team's not going to win many games the rest of the way. It doesn't doesn't look like that's going to happen, but I'm not. Someone else can basically pronounce this team dead before me. I'm not going to do it. I'm an optimistic, optimistic person, but they're one and three. It's a winnable and big game in BC here this week. And I I think, you know, through three and I guess a third games, three and a quarter, whatever it was when Matt Nichols was pulled uh, the other night, uh, I I think everyone could see that he just doesn't have it. It, You know, his, his throwing arm isn't the same. It's unfortunate he's had a real good career, but you know we we just see the difference, and we saw the difference in terms of the offense and how they moved the ball when Dominique Davis was in the game, and they actually scored three offensive touchdowns, so he clearly gives them a better chance to win right now. The defense has to be a lot better, but at the very least. It gives you optimism that they can score off to offensive touchdowns, which there wasn't a lot of optimism, you know, in the first three and a half games that this team was going to score any offensive touchdowns when Matt Nichols was in. So um, pretty obvious move, but, you know, the right move. And I think, you know, just talking to some of the players, they, they, they believe in Dominic Davis. A lot of the veterans, when you talk to them, they they will tell you that 2019 was a bleep show mm-hmm. on that side of the football. There was no offensive coordinator. And they believe to a man that things could have been different if Dominic Davis had the proper coaching and proper offensive coordinator in place. And, and guess what? Now he's got that. Now there's no excuses. He's 32 years old. This is his last chance. He always looks great in practice. He's, he's had flashes, you know, going back to 2018 when he was backing up Trevor Harris. He, he's mobile. He throws the ball well, but at times he believes almost too much in his arm and throws into tight windows that, quite frankly, he shouldn't. And so let, let's, see, let's see what they look like in BC because this is not a juggernaut of a team in the Lions. and. You know, this is a big week for him and 
his career because, you know, after a season like he had in 2019, a lot of guys wouldn't get second chances. But, again, extraneous circumstances for him and the, and the team that year, and they were awful. And certainly what we've seen through four games hasn't been good this year. But I, I want to see how this team looks from snap one with him under center because I think the consensus is when you talk to players that they believe they can win football games when Dominic Davis is in at quarterback. Now, Lee, I want to ask you a question here because uh, I had the benefit of walking out of the stadium with AJ on Friday night mm-hmm. and uh, talking about it. I know he and I differed a little bit on our opinion. The, but... be- the benefit. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. Okay. Yeah, it was good. 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 Get some insight from the voice of the Red Blacks. Yeah. Um, I do like talking to AJ minutes after a game. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's always fired up. But I I thought the one thing Dom Davis couldn't do mm-hmm. if he came in in relief was throw an abhorrent, inexcusable pick, which he did. And uh, mm-hmm. and this is where AJ and I disagreed because the Red Blacks were chasing the game. But I thought given what happened the last time when he had the starters role and we all remember that game against the Riders, mm-hmm. um, how much of a red flag is it to you that he threw that pick six that was just a horrible decision in... And the game was already over. I, I understand that circumstance. But I thought that that was a big mark against him in what otherwise was a really stellar performance in relief. But that was that's the knock against him and the fact that we also saw that. Mm-hmm. Uh, should that be a concern in your opinion? Yes. Now... The biggest concern I have with Dominic Davis is his decision making. And the only way for him to prove otherwise is to get in game situations and make the right decisions. He has not had that opportunity for a while. And I do agree with you, AJ, and talking to a lot of the different people that were involved, that almost nobody would have had a chance to be successful in 2019. So, you. Learn from it what you can, and you move on, and you're not completely judged by it. He has to show better decision-making. But I do think that the positives, the second he came into the game on Friday night, if you were at the stadium or watching on TV or listening to AJ describe it on radio, the difference in the velocity of the throws was dramatic. It wasn't just oh, he's zipping it in a little bit faster than Matt Nichols. It was, there is a large difference between the way the ball is getting to receivers now than the way it was before. And it's not just so that he can show off his arm. The velocity is there on the outside throws to give your receivers a chance to actually make a play and not have three guys surrounding him when the ball gets there. He made... The receivers look better, right? And this is yes. This is not look. Oh, hundred percent. He they, gave they the lost, receivers a chance. They lost two of their best three receivers. You can argue they lost their two best, but but however you slice it, they lost two of their three best receivers before the season in Jalen Saunders with a car accident and Brad Sinopoli due to retirement. So mm-hmm. it's it's a group that was expected to be better, and it's it's more inexperienced than you'd like. It's less dynamic than you would like. But when he came in, all of a sudden, every one of those receivers looked a lot better just because Dominic Davis was in the game. The ball got there quicker, gave them a chance to actually make plays in the open field before having three guys surround them. I I do want to explain, just so people realize some context, right, in terms of what I was saying. Look, there's no doubt. The the, the Saskatchewan game is still ingrained on everybody's mind, right? And, and, you know, that's a game that... You know, it's it's the the one thing I'll say about Dominic Davis. We we saw it in the first game against Calgary last uh, in 2019, last season. It was two years ago, but last season, um, he I think he's got a short memory, and I think that's a good thing, right? You you need him to have a short memory. You don't want him to be a guy that's lacking confidence out there. Um, you know, the first game of the year against Calgary, he threw four interceptions, but found a way to come back, lead the game winning drive. And they won the game, their first ever win at McMahon Stadium is the Red Blacks. Um, but the game against Saskatchewan, I mean, that's that was a game that it's hard to get out of your memory because, you know, those just three awful, awful decisions. And, 
you know, that, that was the end of his season. For the most part, he played a couple of games after that. And actually those games, they had a better chance to win than the ones he didn't play in the second half of the season where they were absolutely mauled in 2019. And that's what gives me a little bit of hope. Those games where they lost against Toronto and BC, the two worst teams in the league outside of Ottawa in 2019, and four of those games were blowouts. Dominique Davis didn't take a snap in those games. So that is at least a little bit encouraging. But we know that the key for Dominique Davis is he's got to protect the football better. My my point on the one, and it wasn't the pick six, the, 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 bad, the real bad decision, the, the pick six ended up being one that deflected off a receiver's hand. The, the bad decision was when he was scrambling, rolling to his left and throwing a ball that, quite frankly, shouldn't have been thrown, and it ended up being an interception. That was at 34-13. Look, if that's 24-13, it's inexcusable. If, you know, or certainly tie game or whatever. And if he makes those types of decisions, especially early against the BC Lions, then you'll be like, okay, here we go again. But the only thing I said about that was that because it was second down, because you're down three touchdowns, I, I don't mind a guy trying to make a play. Because you're, you're down three touchdowns, and if you throw that ball out of bounds, you're still punting, and you're down three touchdowns. So that was the only point that I was making about Dominic Davis. There's no doubt, though. We, we all agree. He needs to, to make better decisions. He can't trust his arm. And, and in, in, in that play, in that instance, his legs, to get out of every situation. Not every play is going to be one that you're going to be able to make. I know he's got a great arm. I know he can fit it into some tight windows, but there have to be some plays where it's like, that's a little too tight. I'm just going to throw this away. Or that's a little bit too tight. I'm just going to scramble for three or four yards, avoid the sack, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get them over the course of, of the 60 minutes, right? But at that point in time, they're down 21. It, it's, it's late in the second half. You throw up your hands and you say, all right, you know, not a great decision for sure, but... I understand at least the thinking more than if it's 24-13 in that mm-hmm. situation. That That's all I was saying in, in that moment. Right. And I think that's fair, AJ. But if you had to write down the number one concern about Dominique Davis. Yeah, it's going to the other team. It's decision making. It's football sense. It's deciding when and when not to throw the football, to bring the football down and run with it, and understanding the game situations and managing those situations. And that's the biggest concern with this. But right now he does give you a better chance to win than Matt Nichols. So you hope over the last couple of years, he's learned something. And that's, that's the benefit for Dominique Davis coming in here is even if he does show some poor decision-making and, and you're right. Thank you for clarifying AJ. I, I, uh, I, I misspoke when I said it was the brutal pick six. Uh, you're right. It was the other interception that he tried oh. to force the throw as he was going down. Uh, that was the one that I meant that was, in my opinion, inexcusable. But the the fact that there's no one else on the team right now that is anywhere close to the ceiling that he has, I, I think should buy him a bit more time if he continues to struggle with decision-making. But... Again, this is just my opinion, but going into Dominique Davis's performance coming into the game in relief, I would have thought it's more important that he doesn't throw any horrible interceptions than that he throws for touchdowns. And that's just my opinion because of how badly it went. And I know there are lots more circumstances. You guys have both done a great job um, explaining that. But I, I think... It's going to be tough for a coach to trust him if he uh, throws, if he makes more decisions like that one. I think it's a really impor- important point that he has to realize. You know, sometimes you live another down and you throw it away. You can't always force the ball and and try to make these hero plays. Here, here's one thing that I'm encouraged about. In 2019, you got the sense he was probably a little bit on an island. Um, and, and look, I know he had. Joe Pow Pow and, and guys like that to go to. But now you've got a definitive offensive coordinator and the head coach in, in, in Paul Lapolis. You've got a quarterback coach. They've never had a quarterback coach. And you've got a guy who's been 
in all sorts of situations in a Steve Walsh. Uh, you've got you've got a backup quarterback now in Matt Nichols that, you know, like here's one of the things we've heard about Matt Nichols all the time and, and you know, why a guy like Paul Apolise, who's dealt with him so much, what, what do you hear about Matt Nichols? What a good pro he is. What a good team guy he is. And so I, I'm sure this hurts, but I'd like to think that Matt Nichols is, as a guy who's been around the league for a long time, is going to be a guy that, that he can lean on as well. So he, he's going to have some support here. Um, it's not going to be easy. It's not the most dynamic group of receivers. But as we saw the other night, you know, it, it, it looks like this is a group that all of a sudden can make plays. And, and again, the offensive line, it reminds me a little bit, and, and we'll see how it goes this weekend. But in 2016, the offensive line was taking a lot of heat here when Trevor Harris was leading this club down the stretch. And they're giving up sacks. And all of a sudden, Henry Burris came in, and the offensive line wasn't a problem at all. And I'm not going to say that he's going to fix all their issues in terms of receivers. You know, they, they have to do a better job week to week of not dropping passes. You know, the, the old line has to keep getting better each and every week. But I, I think what the skill set that he brings to the table should make everybody on the field better. And so does that result in, you know, them moving the football and continuing to, to build on what we saw with those three offensive touchdowns? In the second half last week, uh, hopefully it is. And hopefully you can manage the turnovers a little bit better. You don't expect them to be perfect, but he gives them, and, and, and you know, the certainly seems like the players believe that he gives them a chance to win. And that's, that's what's most important because you, you don't want the players to be as pessimistic as, you know, how a lot of the fans are and the media and everything else, right? There's a lot of people that are pessimistic right now and for good reason this team was three and 15 in 2019 and they've lost three out of four out of the gates and got blown out by your your nearest rival i'm not going to say biggest rival i kind of feel like it's hamilton but your nearest rival in montreal and you know so i can understand like the the fan base has every reason to be disgruntled right now i i get that but in the end it's about that locker room and the belief that they have and as long as they have belief, and I do think they have belief in Dominique Davis when he's at quarterback, that's all that matters. And if they believe it, then they can go out and win in BC. But when your locker room doesn't believe you can win, it's over. And we saw that in 2019, and I certainly hope we don't see that in 2021. It hasn't arrived yet, and that's a good thing. So let's see what they do this weekend. And... If I don't know, AJ, if you heard Micah Alway on the post game show, yeah, no, he was. There's a guy who's optimistic, and that that's what you want. Yeah, and he took some accountability. He's gonna, like I said, be on the Red Box show about six fifteen tonight. But if you listen to him, you thought they won by forty. And well, I I, did, I didn't think they went one by forty based on listening to him. But at least when listening to him, you know, hey, this is a guy that talked about giving 80, 80 plus up at Texas Tech and. Mm-hmm. He's been through tough situations. He knows what it takes to kind of bounce back from those situations. And and to be fair, it's it's not hanging your head and feeling sorry for yourself. You need guys like that yep. that instill belief in the others. Because guess what? If if the defense plays like they did the first three weeks and the offense plays like they did under Dominic Davis, then they have a chance to win football games down the stretch. But it's it's all about the belief in that room. Little embarrassment never hurts either. When you're embarrassed, usually you see a better effort coming out. And they were the defense was embarrassed the other night by the Montreal Alouettes. They were no good. We'll take a break. Some of your texts coming in at twelve twelve hundred. Just after three o'clock, we'll talk a little hockey with the Montreal Canadiens. Did a little bit. AJ, we'll hear from you on Drake Batherson. We didn't get a chance to hear that after we talked to him Friday you weren't on with us so we'll talk some Drake Batherson of course Brady Kachuk Cock and Yemi talk some hockey after three o'clock got some baseball how about the Jays on a nice little streak here got themselves back into it three games behind now the wild card chase and uh, we'll get into some of the tennis as well all coming up on the drive on TSN 1200 
The Drive continues on TSN 1200. Welcome back to The Drive here on TSN 1200. Labor stage, AJ Jack, you back. Matt Consvita, I think one of the favorites of James Absent. Maestro Fresh West, let your backbone slide. Big deal, AJ, when Maestro Fresh West came to my school, my high school. Back in the when was that? early 90s. He's from the Toronto area, right? It's so, good tune. I like that tune. I'd have to say, when did that, Matt, maybe you could look up when that came out. Either late 89, 90, somewhere around there. Released in 1989. 89. There you go. From the album Symphony in Effect. Grade 9. <laughs> Look at that. And you said he... Came to our school. Came to your school. To perform. So you saw Maestro Fresh West in your school. You had to see Britney Spears in a mall. Markville Mall. Markville Mall. Yeah. Um... Yeah, Britney Spears came to the mall. Christina Aguilera came to the mall when Genie in a Bottle came out. The mall tour was a big thing. <laughs> They've evolved since then. <laughs> but yes, Maestro Fresh West came to the school. Uh, we do appreciate, and I mean this very sincerely, uh, a lot of texts coming in at 12 1200 about our first segment, just talking about uh, James. James Abson, our former... Colleague, unfortunately, passed away on the weekend, and it's been difficult, I think, for a lot of people here at the station. But getting a lot of really nice texts, and look, we're all a family here, right? And, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's it's not so good, but everybody's a family here with the listeners and all of us, so we do appreciate it. Um, a number of them coming in. Some of the red black stuff here, AJ, uh, quickly or around the Canadian Football League. How about the uh, Edmonton Elks coming up with a win? Yeah, Tre- Trevor Harris and the boys uh, off the COVID list and and getting a win yesterday over the Calgary Stampeders. I watched all four Labor Day games on the weekend, and. Uh, watched a lot of college football as well, and I was mes- messaging you before the Elks game, mm-hmm. and I basically was saying that the best football I had watched all weekend was, and look, I'm not CFL guy, I'm not NFL guy, I, I would hope as a CFL broadcaster I wouldn't be NFL guy, I'm not college football guy, I just like football. I've said that all along, I said that during the whole XFL talks, everyone's getting their knickers in a bunch. I just want to see football, blocking, tackling, touchdowns, sacks, athleticism, physicality. I just like football. Good football, entertaining football. Yeah. Yep. I don't care about what kind of football it is. Mm-hmm. But you know, I've watched a lot of CFL football this year, as I always do. And quite frankly, you know, when, when I watched the college football this weekend, it was pretty good. It was, it was, it was better than what I've seen. Mm-hmm entertainment wise than a lot of the CFL games that I've seen. But I, but I really thought the last game of the weekend, that was an excellent football game. That that was a fun game to watch. And yeah, the Elks got it done. And James Wilder Jr. I mean, the guy's just, he's a beast. I mean, he was rookie of the year in 2017 and had a couple of years where, you know, he didn't really follow that up. Was that because he was on a bad Toronto team? I don't know, but all I know is this, he kind of like stand back, right? With, with Montreal, a guy that can beat you in so many different ways when you got a 235 pound back that can run over you, but also, you know, make plays in the open field, kind of like a Derrick Henry, kind of like a Marshawn Lynch. So Wilder got it done. Trevor Harris had a really good day and, and that was a big win for the Elks yeah. in Calgary, who you, you're just not used to seeing. At one and four, and granted, no Bo Levi Mitchell for them, and I think Jake Mayer has done a decent job filling in for them. But if they're going to make the playoffs, which is seemingly a rite of passage for the Stampeders for the better part of thirty years, 
they're they're going to need Bo Levi Mitchell back and and sooner rather than later. So yep. great that was a great football game, and and much needed I think for the Canadian Football League. And now it's around that time, right? No preseason, I get it. No games in 2020, I get it. But now is about the time that, that we need to see some good games, some entertaining games, some more offense, and and I think it's coming. Um. It's taken a little longer than I would have expected, but that that was a great Canadian Football League game on Monday. You're right. I it was a good game. The other three not very good. And to your point, I mean, I had the commissioner Randy Ambrosi on the program yeah, on Friday. I listened to that and asked him about the lack of offense around the league because it hasn't been very good. It hasn't been very entertaining. And the first three games this weekend weren't very entertaining. Fortunate that one was. Well, it'd be pretty good if you're an Alouettes fan or a Bombers fan. Oh yeah, like you could be fans of but, teams, but, but the that's games, the thing for for a the, neutral, right? It's that's, the games, right? For a neutral, you want close games, and you want. Yeah, it doesn't have to be like the com- commissioner special. What did he say the commissioner special was? Thirty-five, thirty-five, or thirty-eight, thirty-five. About, yeah, I think he said forty-eight, forty-eight, or something like that. Yeah, like it. We don't need the commissioner special. I'm good with twenty-three, twenty. Like, doesn't have to be super high scoring. But but we we do need some some touchdowns, right? I'm good. I as a guy who loves defense, I've always loved defense when it comes to football. You you still need some touchdowns, and there's been a lot of field goals and punts, and it's it's been slower than expected. But I think I I think it was encouraging, even though the games weren't as close. That you know the offenses seemingly you know with with Hamilton, with Winnipeg, with Montreal, and and, and both teams in the Edmonton Calgary game. That's more than we've seen most weeks in the Canadian Football League. Yeah, I would agree. And some of them comes in garbage time, but at least it, it's going up. It was a better week this week offensively than it's been. Now that's not saying a whole lot, and you, you hope that it gets better than that. And to your point on where the Red Blocks are, I think you have to be encouraged that – you have another week coming up here where insanely like Montreal doesn't play again. Well, yeah, if 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 that's that's the issue with Labor Day, right? And with no Halifax. I could have told you who's got the bye. Basically, it's always one of BC, Montreal, or Ottawa over the course of these two weeks, right? Yeah. So, which is why you wouldn't give Montreal the buy in week number one, but that's another story. Um, Hamilton and Toronto are two and two. One of them is going to be three and two, and one of them is going to be two and three at the end of the weekend. And Montreal is going to be two and two. So, you want to put yourself right in the middle of the entire log jam? Find a way to go out and beat an average BC team. Yeah. No, they're below average right now, the Ottawa Red Blocks. So they got to get up a lot here to become average. But they're playing an average BC team. So there is a possibility to try and figure it out this week. But uh, we're going to start finding out how good of a coach Paul Lapolis is real quick. Because it starts now. Whatever he thought he had in the offseason, he doesn't have anymore. Including his quarterback. So... Yeah, and and honestly, my bar is is pretty low right now in the sense that, like, to me, it's it's about salvaging something this season and building towards next year. And if you don't make the playoffs, it'll be disappointing, but not the end of the world. But you you, you can't you can't go two and twelve, right? They they got to find a way to get to if they finish five and nine, then at least you'll kind of get the sense that there's some progress and there's something to build on and that that they made something out of a pretty tough situation. Because I, I think if you asked a lot of people around the league, they would say this team is probably going to finish 
two and twelve or something like that, right? <laughs> the other and they haven't they haven't really given enough reasons. No, why why they wouldn't be two and twelve? So prove people wrong. Get to get to five wins and you know build on that for next season. That it's it's about that. It's about you know giving this fan base who have seen ten straight ten straight home defeats something to to believe that there's some hope going into next season right that that's going to be the challenge the only college football i watched aj in the weekend was clemson georgia that was not a good game fsu notre dame was you, I know. you missed uh, even though for my purposes the wrong team won certainly not for steve bundas and many fighting Irish fans in this area, but that that was a good football game. And yeah, quite I, the story with with Martin having not played in almost three years. Uh, yeah, great football game for sure. And all right. Another missed Florida State field goal late. It was like watching games in, <laughs> in the 80s and 90s again. AJ will have what you need to know, and we'll talk some hockey between Drake Batherson and the Canadians, the Carolina Hurricanes, Brady Kachuk, and more coming up in the next hour here on The Drive on TSN 1200.